This DVD has been produced by the New Zealand Ministry of Health. It provides information on some of the treatment methods that can be used by small drinking water supplies to help them provide safe drinking water. Untreated water can be a major health risk because it may contain harmful chemicals, protozoa and viruses. Drinking water should therefore be treated to ensure it's safe. This video is about the principles and methods of water treatment, especially for small supplies. Because it's not just big cities that need to treat their water, every small community, such as a marae, a school or a camping ground, should also have safe water. Otherwise, people could get sick. We had a case here in New Zealand a few years back. Kids at this college all came down with acute illness, diarrhoea, vomiting, fever. So we went up there and did some tests on the water and bingo, E. coli in the water. Your classic indicator of faecal material in the water. So next we're going, where did this come from? How did it get in the water? In this instance it was pretty easy to figure out. The place they were taking their water from, that's to say the water catchment area, was also being used to graze stock. Cattle were defecating in the area and this was contaminating the groundwater. The analysis that was done identified that the strain of Campylobacter that had infected the children was the same as the one in the catchment area. So there you are. Kids were drinking water effectively contaminated with animal wastes. Of course you're going to get sick. They didn't follow the three key principles of water treatment. They didn't minimise, they didn't remove and they didn't inactivate. There are three key principles of water treatment. The first one is minimisation. This is where you try to reduce the number of pathogens getting into the water supply in the first place. For example, keeping animals out of your catchment will reduce the faecal contamination of the source water. This is the first barrier to contamination of your water supply. The second principle is removal. You can never entirely stop pathogens getting into your water supply so you need to remove them when they get in. This can be done through filtration, coagulation and settlement. The aim here is to physically remove bacteria, viruses and other contaminants from the water. Removal using things like water filters is a second barrier to contamination of a water supply. Sometimes you simply can't get all the pathogens out of a water supply. In this case you need to apply the third principle of water treatment, inactivation. This is where you use things like chlorine or ultraviolet light to inactivate the pathogens. These three principles, minimization, removal and inactivation, should ideally be used together. This is a multi-barrier approach. Not just one barrier, like a water filter, but a range of methods to keep the water safe to drink. And it all starts where the water is collected, in the catchment area. The first principle of water management, minimization, involves managing the catchment to reduce potential hazards from entering the water supply. This means knowing what activities are happening in your catchment area, what risks may be there, and how those risks can be managed. We were getting bad E. coli tests, yeah. Yeah, we had a UV system. We couldn't figure out what the problem was. We called the drinking water assessor in. Yeah, he came to our plant here. Yeah. He said our water was turbid. It was dirt. We were getting dirty water. We never had that in the, uh, problem with that in the past either. He suggested a catchment survey, yeah. yeah. Up the stream there was a bush block where a developer was subdividing. There was bulldozers and um, making tracks and you know all that sort of stuff, yeah. And, and the clay and stuff was running off into the stream, making the water turbid. Yeah, the UV system was only good for clear water. That's how the E. coli was getting through. Been to one supply where they were doing some tests, got a crook test, checked out the pipes and couldn't find any problems, did another test, still got a crook result, so I suggested going for a walk up into the catchment. Walk up through the catchment, go to the little dam they had up there, and here's a rotted carcass of a goat sitting in the pool where they draw their water out. 
they weren't very impressed. That's a bad thing, right? That's a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, having a whole carcass there is one thing, but having the remains of a carcass, you know that it's just started to, it's got that bloated look, it's exploded, all the guts are rotting away, and it's all going into your drinking water. We get most of our water off the roof, and uh, obviously we can't, you know, stop birds landing on the roof and you know, pooing, uh, but we can try to minimise the risk, um, so we cut down the branches that were hanging uh, over the lodge to try to stop birds, you know, perching on the roof, and uh, we regularly clean out the gutters uh, so that it's all as, um, you know, as uh, clean as possible. Well, we get our water out of the ground, and we're surrounded by orchards and dairy farms and stuff. There's a lot of runoff in the groundwater, chemicals and nitrates and, and there's boron and arsenic as well. And we have to manage this problem by having having bores that are more than 30 metres deep. The water we that means that the water we collect for our supply comes down from deeper than the water that's contaminated by the runoff. Well, here we are. Here we are. This is a stream. This is where we get our water supply from. Yes, but we want to eliminate potential hazards from getting into our water supply. So obviously we don't just stick a pipe in and pull the water out. No, the intake pipe is actually a few metres below the riverbed, so it's filtered by the shingle before we get it. Yeah, and of course that means we don't get um, leaves and dirt and, and fish no. um, in, the, in the water tank. No, nice clear water. And if we reduce the level of contaminants in the water we take, then the less we have to remove or inactivate later. Managing the catchment area is exceedingly important because, hopefully, you can reduce the amount of contaminants even before the water is collected. If you can't manage the activities in your catchment, for example, if you can't control animals or runoff from farms, then at the very least you need to have a really good understanding of what is happening in your catchment area. You will therefore have a better idea of the treatment processes you will need for removal and inactivation. For example, if you're using groundwater, you may have iron and manganese in the source water you're using. OK, you can't eliminate that from your catchment source, but if you know it's there, you can remove it in the next stages of the water treatment or find a better source. If you're getting your water out of a spring, or off a roof, chances are it's quite clean. It won't contain silt, clay and dirt. These are called suspended particles. But if you're getting it out of a river, it may have a lot of suspended particles in it, especially after heavy rains. Obviously, we want to get this, as well as leaves, sticks and other rubbish, out of the water. If you don't, it can block up the water filters and create problems with other parts of the water treatment processes. For example, if the water is too dirty, bacteria can be masked by the suspended particles when it is being treated by UV, and this makes the UV treatment less effective. So we get rid of the suspended particles through pre-settlement. This is basically putting the water into a tank and letting it sit there for a while. The heavy particles sink to the bottom and we extract the cleaner water from the surface. Uh, so what you try to do is settle a lot of the dirt and debris out. Pre-settlement is not going to remove all the bacteria and viruses. What it is trying to do is reduce the load on your existing treatment processes and um, optimise their functions. The problem with pre-settlement is that it might take months or even years for all the fine particles including viruses and protozoa to sink to the bottom of the tank. Those fine particles are called colloids. We can speed up this process by coagulation. This is where you get the colloidal material to stick together by adding a coagulant to like aluminium sulfate. The stuck together larger particles are called flock. They become heavier than the water and sink down to form a sediment at the bottom of the tank which is then removed. This process was actually also used by the ancient Egyptians. They used sand and charcoal filters and they used what they called alum to coagulate their water. They discovered that adding alum made the water less cloudy and taste better. This picture shows them siphoning off the topmost part of the water using suction and reed wicks for pipes. What you're looking at is the first known coagulation plant and we still pretty much do the same thing today. Filtration is the process of removing suspended solids 
from water. It's generally thought that all the particles are removed by passing the water through a filter whose pores are smaller than the particles, similar to a strainer. This is one of the processes, but there are others depending on the type of filter. One of the problems of removing suspended particles is that they are not all the same size. Even pathogens differ in size by an enormous amount. Helminths, which are parasitic worms, lay eggs which are about the width of a human hair. They can be seen with the naked eye. But protozoa are about a third of this size, about three microns in diameter. Bacteria are smaller again, about one hundred the width of a human hair. They can only be seen under a microscope. The smallest pathogen of all is the virus. They are so small they can only be seen with an electron microscope, one ten thousandth the width of a human hair. To compare these sizes, imagine that a helminth egg, the width of a human hair, was the size of a cow. A protozoa would be about the size of a sheep, a bacteria would be the size of a cat, and a virus would be the size of a fly. So, that's the problem with filters that work like strainers. You can build one to keep out the sheep, but the flies are going to buzz right through. One solution is to have a series of filters that get smaller and smaller. Well, uh, cartridge filters are often used in small water supplies. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive and pretty simple, and they rely on the straining principle. They basically have a container with the filter cartridge inside, and the, the particles become lodged in the filter cartridge, and it, and it eventually clogs up. And then the cartridges need to be replaced. So obviously if the source water is dirty, they will clog up much quicker. There are different kinds of cartridges. Some look like wound material, and others look like some kind of foam. It's important to get the right kind for the job you want to do. The cartridge has holes which the water um, flows through and the size of the hole is called the pore size. They can go down to one micrometer which is uh, like one millionth of a meter. This can filter out protozoa but some bacteria and viruses can still pass through. For protozoa you need to get a pore size a bit smaller than the protozoa because they can change shape and squeeze themselves through. The size of particles that a cartridge filter would remove is described as micrometers or uh, just microns. A 5 micron filter cartridge removes much smaller particles than say a uh, 20 micron filter cartridge. Just to confuse things, the cartridges are categorised as either nominal or absolute. OK, if a, if a cartridge is a 5 micron nominal, then it will remove 90% of the 5 micron size particles. Some will pass through. Um, if, it's, if it's 5 microns absolute, then it will remove all 5 micron size particles. Uh, some water suppliers use a 20 micron cartridge filter just to remove larger material, followed by a 1 micron cartridge filter, and that removes protozoa cysts. And usually the 20 micron will be a nominal, but the one micron cartridge will be absolute. Uh, the longer a filter remains in service, um, the more blocked it will become with the material the filter is removing. Uh, when that happens, you find that the water pressure leaving the filter becomes um, less and less. It becomes much less than the pressure of the water entering the filter. This difference in pressure is called uh, head loss. A high difference between the two pressures would indicate the filter is becoming blocked and uh, signify that something should be done. Measuring the head loss by putting a pressure gauge on the filter inlet and on the filter outlet is a cheap and cost effective way of uh, monitoring a small water supply's filter's effectiveness. This is called measuring the pressure differential or uh, the difference in the pressures. For my school science project I made a sand filter. Well, sand filters, when they're operated well, can be very effective, 
Mostly sand filters are used in bigger supplies. Sand filters are basically a tub of sand and the water is fed onto the top and filters through to the bottom. As the water moves through, the particles get stuck in the sand. However, in sand filters, a lot of particles, like protozoocysts, can be smaller than the gaps between the grains of sand and the filter. So sand filters use a, a number of methods to remove particles. Uh, physical straining is one. Um, another is adsorption, uh, not absorption with a B, this is adsorption with a D. Adsorption is when the sand particles have got a charge, uh, which attracts and holds the suspended uh, solid particles to them. So the particles are prevented from passing through the filter. Uh, another process is where the, the particle gets thrown out of the water flow by centrifugal force, which is caused when the flow curves around the sand grain. Uh, so they get held in a place where there is a uh, little water flow until the, um, until the, the, uh, the filter is backwashed. The effectiveness of a sand filter is, uh, is usually measured by monitoring the turbidity. This is basically dirtiness. Turbidity is caused by particles, uh, particles suspended in water. Uh, the higher the turbidity, uh, the greater the amount of suspended particles. If turbidity is high, it indicates that the filter is not working very well. Uh, larger municipal water suppliers are required to install turbidity meters on the outlets of the filters uh, so that they can see if any suspended particles are breaking through the filters. The problems with the sand filters are that they require backwash facilities to clean them and um, they can take a bit of space. Um, also they have um, a high setup cost. Yeah, this is the sand filter. It's pretty simple really. The sand traps the particles and filters out potential pathogens and things like that. They do strain out suspended material but generally use adsorption principles as their mode of operation. Of course, all the material you're filtering out stays in the sand, so eventually it'll start to clog and wouldn't work as effectively anymore. When the filter gets like this, we don't actually change the sand like you might imagine. Instead, we do a filter backwash. So we basically reverse the direction of the water, thereby forcing the material off the sand and out to waste. Sand filters have a, a number of configurations. The, uh, the large water supplies use gravity sand filters. These are large open basins with, uh, with the sand at the bottom and, um, and they rely on gravity to push the water through the sand. Uh, the, the most common type of sand filter used with small supplies is, uh, is pressure filters. Here, here the sand is confined in a pressure vessel and natural water pressure or pumped pressure forces the water through the sand inside the vessel. The, uh, another type of filter that is becoming used more widely are membranes. They're pretty expensive but the price is coming down. Usually they're installed in large supplies but small, some small supplies are starting to use them. Water flows down these tiny straws that are only about a millimetre in diameter. The pores or holes in these straws are so small that even viruses can be filtered out. And there's a big bunch of these straws in every filter vessel. They do need to be cleaned carefully and from time to time need to be cleaned out with some chemical cleaning solution. The water needs to be pretty clean before it goes through these membranes. So pre-settling or something like that is usually necessary. Yeah, they're a pretty complex system, but I think we're going to see a lot more of them. Disinfection of water is the treatment of the water to inactivate or destroy any microorganisms that are present so that they cannot cause infection and illness. Water needs to be pretty clean before disinfection can work. Sometimes clean groundwater is good enough for disinfection to be the only process necessary to make the water safe. But surface waters usually need to be filtered first. 
The three main disinfection processes are heat, like boiling, radiation, which is usually ultraviolet light, and chemical, including chlorine and ozone. Boiling water is expensive, and we only use it to disinfect water in emergency situations, like when there's been an outbreak of illness, and or the water supply is known to be unsafe. Well, ozone uses lots of electricity, and it's usually only used in large town water supplies, so for small water supplies, UV and chlorine are your best bet. Chlorine uses complex chemical reactions to destroy microorganisms. It binds to the surface of the pathogen and ruptures them. Its introduction into drinking water supplies in London before um, 1900 reduced the incidence of cholera and typhoid enormously, and its use has been one of the major advances in disease prevention in the world. Three forms of chlorine are used. Gas, which is supplied in a pressurised container. Calcium hypochlorite, which comes as a granulated powder or tablets and sodium hypochlorite which is a liquid like a really strong bleach solution now gas chlorine is dangerous and difficult to handle and requires site location certificates for storage and approved handler certificates so it is not suitable for very small supplies uh, it actually can be good in small community supplies operated by councils that have the systems in place to manage it Calcium hypochlorite and sodium hypochlorite are the forms used in most small water supplies, but they still do need to be handled with care. When chlorine is added, it is used up by the organic matter in the water. It's necessary then to add enough to make sure that there's always some available to do the disinfecting job. The chlorine that is left after some has been used by combining with organic material in the water is called free available chlorine or FAC. Uh, FAC is what you want to have if you're using chlorine as a disinfectant. Uh, you need to test the water to show that FAC is present. Uh, it's pretty easy to do though, it can be done with an analyzer uh, or samples can be tested for colour change when reagents are added. Uh, chlorine also takes a little time to work, especially in cold water. Um, so the water needs to be held in storage for at least 30 minutes before it's supplied to the first person. This is called contact time. Um, nearly all the pathogens are pretty sensitive to chlorine, so you don't need to use much. Normally about 0.2 parts per million of FAC is enough. A minimum of 0.2 parts per million. Right. If the water is dirtier, you might need more. Now, the great yeah, thing about... Hang on. Unfortunately, chlorine is not very effective against mm. cryptosporidium. It would need a high dose mm. of chlorine with a really long contact time to kill it. The great thing about chlorine is that it provides a residual disinfectant. It goes on working after the water leaves the treatment plant. It goes on destroying pathogens until the water comes out of the tap. Yeah, so here's the chlorine gas bottles. Uh, we've got two of them so that when one runs out, the other one kicks in. Uh, the water goes through this pipe down here and the gas gets fed in through this pipe here. Um, if you're using gas, you need to have specially trained staff because uh, it's actually very dangerous. Uh, a small treatment plant probably wouldn't use gas, they'd use liquid chlorine because it's, it's a lot easier and it's safer. Uh, we put liquid chlorine into the water um, just, just a tiny bit. Um, there's some resistance to it because people generally don't like putting chemicals in with their water. But the amounts are infinitesimal and the benefits are just so great. Another inactivation method which is becoming increasingly used is disinfection through ultraviolet radiation. And basically what we're doing here is hitting microorganisms with ultraviolet light at a wavelength of 254 nanometers. And this disrupts the DNA or RNA of the pathogen, preventing the pathogen from reproducing and therefore debilitating it. It's become inactivated rather than killed. It might still be present in your water, but as it can no longer multiply inside you, it can't make you sick. The water needs to be exposed to the UV long enough for it to work, and the water needs to be clean. 
Not only can the pathogens hide inside the suspended material, but these particles in the water can absorb the UV light. The pathogens in the water may not get a big enough dose of UV to be inactivated. You've got to have a turbidity removal process prior to UV for your UV to be really effective. Another problem that needs to be guarded against is that some substances dissolved in the water can completely block out the UV light, even though the water appears to be completely clear. And this is called UV transmittance. It is therefore necessary to check whether the water being treated suffers from this problem. And this is done by measuring the UV transmission, which should be more than 80% at a wavelength of 254 nanometers. This is our UV system. Um, now, a UV system is called a reactor. Uh, the water comes through here, goes through the filter, which removes the suspended particles, and then goes through the tube. And there is a UV light uh, in the middle of the tube. Um, now, this is important. This is a flow restrictor. Um, and this adjusts the, uh, the rate at which the water flows through, uh, through the reactor. And now the flow can be restricted so that the, the pathogens are exposed to the light for the right amount of time. Um, now the UV lamp is in a sleeve. I can show you this just a second. Um, it is here. Uh, now the sleeve can get dirty uh, and so it needs, it needs to be cleaned uh, from time to time. Uh, you also need to make sure that the lamp's giving out enough light uh, as they can get weaker over time. Um, now the best way uh, is to install one of these, or to have one of these. Um, this is a, a UV sensor, uh, and it's actually what the, the drinking water standards require. Now the sensor measures the UV dose, uh, and if it gets too low, it can send an alarm uh, to, the, to the operator, to me, uh, so that I know that something's gone wrong and I can come and I can clean the sleeve or I can replace the lamp um, or a, uh, a UV sensor can just close the whole plant down. The great thing about using UV is that there are no chemicals added so it reduces operational costs. One of the advantages of UV is that it inactivates cryptosporidium and chlorine doesn't. On the other hand, a disadvantage is that it doesn't provide a residual disinfectant the way chlorine does. Once your water leaves the treatment plant, you have to keep it clean. The responsibility to maintain drinking water quality doesn't end once it's left your filters or UV unit or whatever system you're using. For example, if it goes into a storage tank, you should be doing regular maintenance and checks and making sure the lid hasn't blown off and that birds aren't contaminating it. If you're going to do some maintenance work or repairs on your pipes, you clean the work area around it. You disinfect your pipes and all the rest. Also, if you've got other takeoff points, then you should have backflow prevention on those takeoff points. It's the philosophy of managing your water quality once it's left the treatment plant. Your responsibility doesn't end there. If you know that your water supply is not safe and needs some kind of treatment, you can't just buy a filter and a UV or chlorine system, attach it to your system and expect everything to be okay. All water supplies are different and the water has different characteristics. The risks in your supply may be different to the risks in another supply. The treatment options you choose needs to be matched to your water supply. One of the best things you can do is write a risk management plan. This is a simple way of working out what risks there are in your water supply. You can then base your selection of treatment options around managing those risks. Risk management plans can be quite simple for small supplies. First you work out what could go wrong in the water supply that would lead it to becoming contaminated. Then you work out what things would indicate that something had gone wrong. You work out which of those things is the most urgent to fix and which are not so pressing. You then can work out a plan of what you are going to do, which thing you will do first. Knowing the risks you need to manage will help you to decide which treatment options are best for your supply. It's good to know a bit about your water supply before you start making decisions. How dirty or clean is it? That's turbidity. 
Does the turbidity increase after it's been raining or does it always stay the same? Does the water have a lot of faecal contamination? An E. coli test will show this. Does the water have colour or low pH? Maybe it has high pH. Will UV travel through it easily? You can find all these things out by getting some simple analysis done. You can also get a good idea of the water quality by doing a catchment assessment. Is the water flowing through your farmland? Are there wild animals in the catchment? Or, if you are using groundwater, how deep is the bore? The answers to these kinds of questions will help you in selecting the best treatment options for your supply. An important thing to think about is the multi-barrier approach. This means making sure your water supply has more than one barrier to contamination. It could be protecting the catchment and using filters and chlorine. That's three barriers. Or if you have a spring, it could be enclosing the top of the spring to keep everything out and then installing a UV unit. That would be two barriers. It's a matter of putting as many stages of protection between the users of the water and whatever contaminants are in the water as you can. So it all, it all goes back to the three principles of water treatment. Minimisation, removal and inactivation. Put in a barrier for each of these principles. That's why it's called the multi-barrier approach. It's really helpful as well to talk to other water suppliers, find out what they're using, how well it works, what it costs to run. You can learn a lot from others' mistakes and also from the good decisions they've made. Have a look at what others are using, gather up information and consider it all before you make any decisions. Every community's needs differ, as does the quality of the water source, so the choices in the type of treatment need to reflect that. If you've got nice clean water that comes out of the ground, then you would choose a process that matches the level of risk. If the water is clean and clear, then you may have the risk of pathogens, but not too much risk of silt and clay. You probably don't need filters, you might only need UV. What if the groundwater is a bit dirty? That dirty water is going to interfere with the effectiveness of your UV system. So you would need to remove those suspended solids first. So then perhaps you would consider putting in a sand filter or a pressure filter. Choosing this process would depend on the water quality and the level of risk. Right, well, if you're taking your water from a spring, then first you'd try to identify the risks of contamination to that spring water. And, you know, spring water comes from underground, so pretty hard to, to know too much about it. You, you could test it for E. coli. Uh, normally with springs we accept that they're likely to have some sort of contamination. You know, um, you could protect the area where the water is bubbling out of the ground by sealing it in a box if you can. You might get away with just UVing it, However, if the spring water quality changes every time it rains, then there's a, a risk of surface influence on that spring water. Uh, therefore, you're going to need to maybe look at a removal process prior to your inactivation with UV. Uh, or you could manage that by putting in cartridge filters with different pore sizes to remove those suspended solids. Lots of water supplies use streams, which get pretty dirty when it rains. You might decide to install some settling tanks up front to try to remove a lot of the gross contamination, then piping it to maybe two stage cartridges, say 10 microns and 1 micron. If you're supplying water to a larger number of people, say 2 to 300 people, then maybe dosing chlorine is the best option. So your options are varied and it's not a one stop shop, one size fits all. It's about the quality of your water and the risks you need to manage. Obviously, drinking water needs to be clean and safe. Deep ground water can be clean when it comes out of the ground, but surface water and some ground water needs treatment to make it safe to drink. Remember the three key principles of water treatment. Minimization, removal and inactivation. That is, the importance of 
managing the catchment to keep the water as clean as possible before treatment, the usefulness of pre-settlement, and the processes and methods of filtration, including cartridges and sand filters, and the use of chlorine, ultraviolet light, or other methods to disinfect the water. All of these things are barriers to the contamination of a water supply and will contribute to ensuring drinking water is free of pathogens. After all, if you're the person providing drinking water to others, you have a responsibility to ensure it is clean and safe. Treating the water is a way you can do this.